to all of you and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Thank you very much. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 of the morning of the 6th of June, 1968, 25 hours after he was shot in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. He'd been celebrating his victory in the Californian presidential primaries. He was undoubtedly set to become the 37th President of the United States. His killer was caught in the pantry with a smoking gun. He seemed to be a deranged lone assassin. Thousands of mourners stood in silence as his funeral train slowly crossed America. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today, pray that what he was to us, what he wished for others, will someday come to pass for all the world. Immediately after the shooting, the police arrested Sihan Sihan, a young Palestinian. He'd been caught in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel with a smoking gun. Sirhan was apprehended with a gun in his hand, literally a smoking gun. There were witnesses, many of them very good, who saw Sirhan with the gun, who saw Sirhan shoot Bobby, shoot at Bobby, uh, Sirhan was immediately apprehended, and for all intents and purposes, it was an open and shut case. Within hours, Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty announced the identity of the assassin. Tell you that his name appears to be Sirhan, S-A-R-H-A-N, Sirhan. Both names, Sirhan, Sirhan. There were 76 people in the pantry that night. All of their evidence flatly contradicts the official version. Every single eyewitness insisted that Siran Saran was always in front of the senator and at least six feet away. Yet the shots that killed Kennedy were fired from point blank range into the back of his head. I am absolutely convinced Siran's gun did not fire the bullets that killed Bobby. There was a second gun there. 
and it was fired. Born in 1925, Robert Francis Kennedy was the third of four sons born to Rose and Joseph Kennedy. Their wealth and social position ensured a charmed life. Bobby was the academic of the family, graduating from Harvard with a degree in law. But in 1959, he abandoned law to run John Kennedy's campaign to win the presidency. Bobby ran a brilliant, sometimes ruthless campaign, which ensured his brother entered the White House the following year. He was appointed Attorney General and immediately launched a bitter crusade against organized crime and the men like Jimmy Hoffa, who ran it. What? That you betrayed the union membership. Well, I say that is not true, and I say you have no foundation for any such a statement, and you'll produce it for this public Well, here. now I'll ask you the question. Civil rights for America's black community became another great crusade for Bobby Kennedy as Attorney General. Every American, no matter what his background, what his creed, what color of his skin, or where he lives, shall walk with dignity and honor in the United States. I think every man is to find a job. I think every man is entitled to raise his family in an area where they have schools. In the southern states of America, his support for the Freedom Riders and Martin Luther King earned him the undying enmity of right-wing police and politicians and the loyalty of the poor, the black, and the oppressed, whom he championed. Give me your help! Give me your help! Uh, I, was be I was losing faith in the American system, and I was losing faith in my white fellow American. So therefore, when Bobby Kennedy came along, there was a white person who was sensitive to the problems of this nation in a manner that did not gloss over it, its inequities. After John Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Bobby's wilderness years began. He became convinced that America should withdraw from Vietnam. In his presidential bid, removing troops from Vietnam became a priority. He spelled it out in his final interview, given minutes before he was shot. Had more Americans killed there in the last several weeks than any time during the war. When now, six months ago, we were talking about bombing Hanoi and we're concerned about that because we're going to kill civilians. Now we're killing large numbers of them as we bomb Saigon. I just think that uh, we just have to change our policies. And I would hope that the Democratic Party would recognize that. He felt responsible for what was happening in Vietnam. And as a person who was involved in the anti-war movement uh, for several years up to that point, it's one of the reasons I supported him, because I felt he was the only candidate who could end the war. And for a time, it looked as though Bobby Kennedy would become president and bring about change. The California primary was the acid test. Lose and the battle was over, win and he was certain of the Democratic nomination to fight against Richard Nixon. The campaign concentrated on poor and black neighborhoods. And there, people accepted him, they trusted him, and I think in the in the polls, uh, when the polling took place in the in the June 4 primary in 1968, for the per first time, Mexican Americans, African Americans were lining up before the polls opened, just to be able to vote for Robert Kennedy. At a little before midnight, the returns showed a clear victory for Kennedy. For the hundreds of campaign workers and supporters, it was a time for celebration. Uh, people were were cheering and screaming and. Uh, it was wonderful because he, he just stood there for about five minutes just sort of soaking it in. It was very nice to see that because he was, he seemed to be such a, a humble man. Unlike his brother who was, who was a, rather a showman, uh, Bobby Kennedy you really felt this sort of kinship with. What I think is quite clear is, is that we can work together in the last analysis and that what has been going on within the United States over the period of the last three years, the divisions, the violence, the disenchantment with our society, the divisions, whether it's between blacks and whites, between the poor and the more affluent, or between age groups or on the war in Vietnam, that we can start to work together. We are a great country, and a selfish country, and a compassionate country. And I intend to make that my basis for running and over the period of the next year. At that point, we turned to go to a a press conference for the print uh, media uh, in the colonial room beyond the pantry.
as we headed in that direction, Bob stopped to shake hands with a, with a couple of kitchen workers. I can remember uh, the, the joy I felt at that point because I felt this was symbolic of the campaign. That uh, we now have a, a, a president. When the shooting started, and uh, I just saw him drop, like a puppet, the strings cut, and he just twisted and fell. And uh, people in front of me started to fall. I just uh, uh, started shaking violently, I saw flashes, heard crackling, and just fell and blacked out. Uh, but later I found out that Bob's uh, last words were, is everybody okay? As with the assassination of JFK five years earlier, the police decided almost immediately that the killer was a lone deranged gunman. Within hours of arresting Saran Saran, Los Angeles police discovered an apparent motive for the assassination. They found notebooks at Saran's apartment containing threats to kill Kennedy because of his support for Israel in its war against the Arabs. They also discovered Saran had been seen earlier on the day of the shooting acting suspiciously. Saran had spent four hours rapid firing into targets at the San Gabriel Valley Gun Club. The intensity of his practice ensured that there were many witnesses able to identify him to the police. Later, he was seen at the Ambassador Hotel, where Bobby Kennedy was holding his post-election celebrations. Security was provided by a private security company. Los Angeles police had told its officers to stay away from the hotel. It was uh, very unusual in that we had uh, been informed there would be no security at the Ambassador. Uh, I say very un unusual because it, when any uh, person of state came in to uh, the city, there was a, a at least a minimum deployment of security personnel. With no police guarding the hotel, Saran was easily able to slip into the kitchen pantry, concealing a revolver. According to Los Angeles police, as the senator walked through the pantry shaking hands with kitchen workers, Saran stepped from beside a steam table and pointed his gun at Kennedy and hotel maitre d' Carl Yucca. Yucca explained what happened next to reporter Ted Chirac in this 1971 film. In front. So in front, yeah. I had him right in front of me. I didn't let him pass me. So at that time, I hit one shot. So I pushed him down and I put him over the steam table. And here, Shahan keeps on pulling to, to the left side. And that's when he starts shooting very rapidly. Five other people were wounded that night. All had been walking behind Bobby Kennedy through the kitchen pantry. The wounded were taken to the Good Samaritan's Hospital in downtown Los Angeles. Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 in the morning of the 6th of June in 1968. Later that morning, scene of crime officers, a police forensics expert, and Los Angeles coroner Thomas Noguchi began a careful examination of the scene of the shooting. The forensics expert was LAPD's chief criminalist, Dwayne Wolfer. Within hours, he drew up a complicated trajectory diagram accounting for all eight bullets in Saran's gun and showing how they had killed Bobby Kennedy and wounded five other people. Bullet one entered Senator Kennedy's head behind the right ear. Bullet two entered Senator Kennedy's right rear shoulder approximately seven inches below the top of the shoulder and was lodged in his spine. Bullet three entered Senator Kennedy's right rear back approximately one inch to the right of bullet two. This bullet traveled upward and forward and exited from the victim's chest. It then passed through a ceiling tile and was lost somewhere in the ceiling interspace. Bullet four passed through the shoulder pad of Senator Kennedy's suit coat, never entering his body, and traveled upward, striking Paul Schrade in the center of his forehead.
bullet five struck Ira Goldstein in the left rear buttock. Bullet six passed through Goldstein's trousers, ricocheted off the cement floor, and hit Irwin Stroll in the left leg. Bullet seven hit William Weasel in the abdomen. Bullet eight struck the plaster ceiling and then struck Mary Evans in the head. Now this was obviously a, uh, an open and shut case right from the beginning with all of the witnesses and the physical evidence. And uh, I don't think it probably could have been handled uh, uh, in any better fashion than it really was. But from the outset, there were discrepancies in the evidence, which shows that Saran might not have been the only gunman to have fired. The Los Angeles police dismissed or ignored these discrepancies. But it appears that they concluded within about an hour's time that Saran acted alone, or that was going to be their conclusion, and they thereafter tailored all of the evidence to fit that conclusion. Sihan's lawyer, Russell Parsons, trial strategy may have unwittingly assisted in the suppression of the evidence by never bringing up these crucial points. He even cut short the autopsy evidence, which would have proved Saran could not have killed Kennedy. Instead, he persuaded Saran to admit the shooting, but plead diminished responsibility, as he could remember nothing about it and still doesn't. A major discrepancy in the evidence was the distance between Saran and Robert Kennedy. The autopsy showed that the shots which hit Kennedy were fired from a distance of no more than three inches. One a gunshot wound was found behind the right ear, and uh, there were abundance of a powder a deposit on the edge of the uh, right ear. And uh, after testifying at the similar weapon, we came to conclusion that the muzzle distance would be a uh, one inch from the right uh, ear edge and, and no more than three inches. But LAPD's own star witness, Carl Yucker, who was the closest to Kennedy in the pantry, insists that Saran's gun never got that close. How far would the gun muzzle be from Senator Kennedy's head? About a foot and a half, I would say foot and a half, two feet. Yucker's evidence was never heard at the trial yet it was supported by all other eyewitnesses in the pantry. The muzzle of Sirhan's gun was two to three feet away from Senator Kennedy's head. The gun was at least two feet away at all times. The closest the muzzle of the gun got to Senator Kennedy was approximately three feet. Los Angeles police knew the evidence contradicted their version of events. They even filmed a series of reconstructions using witnesses like Carl Yucker. Yucca repeatedly told the police that Saran's gun never came within a foot and a half of Kennedy and could not therefore have fired the shots which the autopsy showed had killed him. These reconstructions have been kept under lock and key since 1969. LAPD has never acknowledged their existence. A similar set of reconstructions was filmed by the Los Angeles District Attorney with eyewitness Lisa Urso. In them, Urso can be heard placing Saran several feet away from Senator Kennedy. The person who had the gun in their hand was about um, three or four feet from the senator. And stopped to shake hands. And at the same time, turned to shake hands. Uh, somebody brushed my side to look as if they were going to shake hands with the senator. And about a uh, foot in front of me, I saw him reach around to his left side and pulled out uh, something and in that minute, a few moments I saw uh, the gun at the top of his head, saw fire come out of the gun. This film has never been seen before. The district attorney's office has never released it. The official reconstruction shows that Saran was always in front of Senator Kennedy. This is supported by all the eyewitnesses who insisted that Saran was in front of Kennedy at all times. Yet the autopsy said that the shots that killed Kennedy were fired from behind. So how could Saran have been in a position to shoot the senator? Was it possible for Saran to get behind you and behind Senator Kennedy and shoot from behind? 
No, you. this was uh, complete impossible because her hand was in front of me and he, he didn't have no way to go behind me. Another major discrepancy is the bullet trajectory analysis drawn up by LAPD criminalist Wayne Wolfer. Bullet 8, which he showed hitting Mary Evans on a downward ricochet, never happened. Mary Evans' medical report states quite clearly she was hit by a bullet travelling upwards. LAPD's account of the bullet which wounded Paul Schrade in the forehead is equally fantastic. The police said it had gone through the, the uh, shoulder area of Bob's coat, didn't hit his body, entered in, and came out near the seam. We found uh, photographs in the Los Angeles Police Department that uh, showed uh, a police officer wearing Robert Kennedy's coat and a rod had been put through those two holes uh, to show the bullet path uh, which went in a steep upward direction away from me. Uh, so it really seems strange to me, a bullet that's going through the coat and at this upward direction away from me would hit me in the head. Uh, I would have had to have my, uh, my head on Robert Kennedy's shoulder uh, for that shot to have hit me uh, or been nine feet tall. Uh, what is interesting is that you have uh, probably six, seven, eight good eyewitnesses who were right there, who have never wavered from what their original statements were. Uh, and in that instance, they are probably very reliable. But these discrepancies between the eyewitness evidence and the LAPD case didn't worry Attorney General Evel Younger. Oh, I don't, uh, I don't think there were any major discrepancies. If somebody says one inch and somebody else says two inches, that's a discrepancy. But the jury didn't think it was a significant discrepancy, and neither did I. But none of the conflicting eyewitness evidence was ever put before the jury. The LAPD case rested on the ballistics report drawn up by its chief criminalist, Dwayne Wolfer. I think that uh, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the courts uh, all around this land uh, who have entertained his testimony and in other countries where he's gathered evidence share my opinion that he is a man who uh, is extremely sound and extremely scientific and extremely qualified. Throughout its inquiries, Los Angeles police maintained an unshakable confidence in its forensics expert. In two other cases, courts have rejected his evidence completely. One judge described his testimony as negligently false, borders on perjury, and is at least given with a reckless disregard for the truth. In the Kennedy case, his account of the number of bullets is directly contradicted by the FBI and its own senior crime officer probably upwards of 90% of that forensic evidence was badly mismanaged. The FBI found another major discrepancy in the LAPD case. In the center divider, its scene of crime officers found two .22 caliber bullet holes. The importance of those two holes is that they would be two more bullets than Sirhan's gun was capable of firing. Sirhan's gun fired eight bullets. According to the Los Angeles Police Department, they have accounted for all eight bullets, and in their accountability, those two holes in the center divider do not figure into it. The FBI report states that its officers ultimately located four extra bullets in the woodwork, taking the total to 12, Remember, any more than eight bullets in the pantry means there had to be a second gunman. In fact, more than 10 police officers later made statements that they saw evidence of bullets in the pantry woodwork. I observed what appeared to be a small caliber bullet lodged in a door jam. I saw quite a few bullet holes. One of the investigators said, we've just pulled a bullet out of here. I recall a man trying to take a bullet out of the door frame with a silver knife. I remember taking lots of pictures of bullet holes. Dwayne Wolfer also marked the holes using string to illustrate the bullet trajectory. Despite this testimony from its own officers, LAPD now insists the marks it photographed were merely nail holes. 
that's completely false and erroneous. Uh, I was there right at that moment and observed it, and and they were positively bullet holes. I, anyone who's saying anything other than that didn't actually see those holes the way I saw them and, and does not know what they're talking about. There is substantial evidence, particularly the evidence pointing to the probability that there was more than eight bullets recovered from the scene, therefore more than one gun fired. It indicates there was someone else involved. I don't have any doubt that there was another gun in the pantry and that it was fired. Sirhan's gun and the bullets fired from it are responsible for wounding five other people. I am absolutely convinced Sirhan's gun did not fire the bullets that killed Bobby. At Sirhan's trial, Dwayne Wolfer testified that the bullets recovered from Bobby Kennedy's body came from Sirhan's gun and no other gun in the world. However, the reality is very different. Since 1971, three of America's leading ballistics experts have all identified clear differences between those bullets and the others test fired from Saran's gun. And an official scientific investigation has concluded that there was insufficient evidence to make such a claim. But there were also witnesses who told the police they saw two people escaping, a young couple who'd boasted they'd killed Kennedy. When a young couple in their late teens or early 20s came running by in a state of glee, very uh, excited, very happy, uh, stating, uh, shouting, uh, we shot him, we shot him, we killed him. I recall saying they're getting away or something very similar to that, meaning that I felt that they were part of whoever it was at the time that was shooting the senator. The most persuasive witness was Sandy Serrano. She gave her account in a television interview less than an hour after the shooting. She would be browbeaten by the Los Angeles Police Department and has never spoken out since. Came running down the stairs and said, we've shot him, we've shot him. And I says, who did you shoot? And she says, we shot Senator Kennedy. Well, it clearly worried him because it was inconsistent with our conclusion that Saran was there alone and acted alone. They uh, badgered and, and browbeat witnesses to get them to change their stories. And they were trying to embarrass me and uh, question my sanity and question uh, my intent. That was the most grotesque abuse of police power I had ever witnessed. Sihan Bishara Sihan was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death, which was later commuted to life imprisonment. He has never been able to remember anything about the assassination, not even the dark-haired woman in a polka dot dress seen with him by 11 separate witnesses in the Ambassador Hotel that night. Today, Sihan is still held in Solidad High Security Prison. From the outset, LAPD and the District Attorney's Office announced it would carefully examine any evidence which pointed to a conspiracy. We've interviewed 4,000 people and we've done it because uh, someday somebody, for purposes best known to themselves, regardless of the evidence, is going to try to prove that Sirhan didn't do it, that this was a conspiracy, that this is some big mysterious uh, plan that uh, in spite of all the investigation we haven't been able to uncover. We knew it would happen. But the accounts of the eyewitnesses and the physical evidence conflicts with the official version. Sirhan's gun and the bullets fired from it are responsible for wounding five other people. I am absolutely convinced Sirhan's gun did not fire the bullets that killed Bobby. But Los Angeles police ignored, destroyed, and covered up this evidence. The LAPD did a terrible job of handling the evidence. They did not care for it properly, they didn't inventory it properly, they destroyed it, they altered it, they falsified it. The cover-up began even before the courts had finished hearing the case against Saran. Coroner Thomas Noguchi was told to keep his autopsy findings secret. I was advised uh, uh, not to uh, 
have uh, any information released as to the death of uh, Senator Robert F. Kennedy. I told him I cannot do that. Unable to gag Noguchi, the Los Angeles authorities fired him, alleging misconduct in the Kennedy autopsy. Well, a paradox that's never been explained is how the Los Angeles County, through the district attorney's office, could base a murder charge on the autopsy of Dr. Noguchi, and then in the hearing uh, uh, relative to his firing, uh, tried to take the same autopsy to show that he should be fired. I said uh, things that I have to do, and uh, that is the cause of death and circumstances surrounding death. And naturally, there's sometimes a puzzle. Jigsaw puzzle is not complete. Uh, uh, that, but you, I cannot adjust to this uh, circumstance to fit the scientific fact. Finally, on August the 1st, 1969, Los Angeles District Attorney's Office was forced to abandon its case against Noguchi. The coroner was reinstated. By then, Los Angeles Police Department had already destroyed much of the key evidence. The center dividers where scene of crime officers noted bullet holes and .22 caliber bullets were destroyed on the 27th of June, 1969. The official reason given by the LAPD was that they would not fit in a filing cabinet. 2,400 photographs were burnt secretly in a hospital incinerator. Among those photographs were the only pictures taken at the moment of the assassination itself. Now this is everything that took place in the pantry during the shooting from behind Robert Kennedy. Uh, so what that would have shown, the interesting part about that would have been, you would have seen if there were a second gun, you would have seen the position of everyone. Uh, most important, you would have seen the position of Robert F. Kennedy when the shooting took place. Scott Agnott was a 15-year-old amateur photographer and Kennedy supporter. Within minutes of the assassination, LAPD went to extraordinary lengths to get hold of his film. I looked up to see a shotgun, I looked up to see guns drawn all around me. Uh, they took my wallet, they took my camera, they took the film out of my pockets. Uh, they took me and they tossed me into the back of a squad car, which was sitting out uh, right in front of the entrance. LAPD promised to return all Scott's film, but when he called at the Parker Center police headquarters, his photographs were locked in a security cabinet. And uh, I was not allowed to look at the film. Uh, they took the stack of prints and one of the detectives shuffled through them and separated it into two piles. And basically he gave me the photographs fr from one roll of film uh, leading up to the assassination, uh, and then everything after the assassination. Everything that I had taken in the pantry was gone. Those photographs, which might have either proved or destroyed the prosecution's case, had been incinerated by order of LAPD. If the police department was right, then my photographs only would have, would have proved that they were right. So uh, for them to destroy it uh, uh, only leads me to believe that, they're, uh, that something's being covered up. There's no reason to have destroyed that evidence. Uh, there's no reason to have summarily destroyed at such an early stage all the photographic evidence. I can't come up with a reason, lo a logical reason why they would have done that. But LAPD was still faced with the testimony of the witnesses who claimed to have seen a man and a woman with Saran in the Ambassador Hotel crowds less than an hour before the assassination. There were three people that just didn't fit. They were not as happy as everyone else. They had sour faces and there was just something about them that uh, did not, just didn't rub me right. And uh, I had uh, told a friend of mine about their presence and later on uh, I saw them in the pantry when I first went through and uh, I saw the short person who turned out eventually to be Sirhan and I saw a taller gentleman uh, and a lady, a very well-built lady with a white polka dot dress on. Official LAPD files reveal that at least 11 witnesses noticed Saran in the company of the polka dot dress girl and another man inside the Ambassador Hotel in the hours before the shooting. At a little before midnight, a witness saw them enter the pantry via an outside stairway which led from the car park to the second floor of the hotel. When he started to shoot, the other two turned and ran through a side door. And I said then, I said, they're getting away. The couple ran out the way they came in, then onto a stairway where Sandy Serrano, a young Kennedy worker, was standing. 
I was standing there just thinking, you know, thinking about how many people there were and how wonderful it was. Then this girl came running down the stairs in the back, came running down the stairs and said, we've shot him, we've shot him. And I says, who did you shoot? And she says, we shot Senator Kennedy. And after she had, a, I can remember what she had on and everything. She was Caucasian. She had on a white dress with polka dots. She was light skinned, dark hair. She had black shoes on and she has a funny nose. And after that, a boy came down with her. He was about 23 years old and he was Mexican American because I can remember that because I'm Mexican American. Sandy Serrano wasn't the only witness to the escape of the polka dot dress girl and her companion. LAPD Patrol Sergeant Paul Suraga was the first police officer on the scene. He arrived within minutes of the shooting. Immediately, he was met by an older couple in a state of near shock. They were quite hysterical, very hysterical, and uh, were spontaneous. The woman stated that she and her husband were outside the, just outside the embassy room when a young couple in their late teens or early 20s came running by in a state of glee, very uh, excited, very happy, uh, stating, uh, shouting, uh, we shot him, we shot him, we killed him. And the woman says, who, who did you kill? And the young lady uh, said, Kennedy, we shot him, we killed him. I immediately put out a broadcast with the description of the suspects, uh, male and a female Caucasian, the uh, a female Caucasian uh, wearing a uh, polka dot dress. The source of it. But within minutes, Paul Shiraga's urgent APB was abruptly cancelled by a senior officer. He said, well, I want you to uh, stop putting out that broadcast. Uh, suspects, words of fact, the suspects in custody. Uh, uh, he didn't want to make a conspiracy out of it or didn't want anyone to make a conspiracy out of it. The official police notebook entry Paul Shiraga made of the old couple's name, address and phone number mysteriously disappeared. It was followed by all three official copies of his meticulous duty report detailing their testimony. But LAPD didn't know that Shiraga had kept a copy at home for safekeeping. Two senior officers secretly created an entirely bogus interview with Shiraga, completely changing his evidence about what the Bernsteins had told him. Here is, is they took an earlier report of mine had changed the wording in it to uh, reflect that I had retracted my initial uh, statement. The bogus document suggests that the polka dot dress girl said they shot him, not the more incriminating, we shot him. This in itself was, uh, was wrong. It was, it's a criminal act to, to modify an official report, uh, but it hit me the moment I looked at it. I said, I never gave this report. Uh, I was never interviewed, and this is false. The detectives forced witnesses to undergo a polygraph test and claimed the results proved that the witnesses were lying. No reliable record of those results were ever made public, but audio tapes prove the police broke every rule covering the conduct of such tests. Well, I think the best example of the coercion of witnesses is the polygraph interview that Sergeant Hank Hernandez took of Sandy Serrano. Sandy was a young woman, she was about 18 years at the time, who uh, stated that she saw a young woman in a polka dot dress and a male come out of the ambassador yelling, we shot him, we shot him. Uh, that, of course, would have been indicated an accomplice to Serrano was inconsistent with the one gunman theory, so the LAPD wanted to get her to retract that. Uh, Sergeant Hernandez called her in for a polygraph interview and spent 40 to 50 minutes just haranguing her and trying to get her to retract that statement. He said, I think you owe it to Senator Kennedy, the late Senator Kennedy, to come forth, be a woman about this. If he, and you don't know, and I don't know whether he's a witness right now in this room watching what we're doing in here. Don't shame his death by keeping this thing up. I have compassion for you. I want to know why. I want to know why you did what you did. This is a very serious thing. I, I've been most painful. No, 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 Sandy. I don't know what I told you about that. You can't say you saw something yeah, when you well, didn't I see it. Sandy, look, I can, I can explain this to the investigators where you don't even have to talk to them and they won't talk to you. I can do this. 
but please in the name of Kennedy. I don't want to know the name of Kennedy. I'm going to just do this. You know that this is wrong. You may want to be pushing it out with a smirk on your face, with a smile, but you know that deep inside what you have done. I remember seeing a girl. No, no. I'm talking about what you have told here about saying a person tell you we have shot Kennedy. And that's wrong. No, it isn't, Sandy. Please, don't laugh at all. Just a hurry. Look, at, look at, I love this man. And you're shaming your, he, if right now, if he can't even, well, I'm trying not to shun, but this is a very emotional thing with me too, you see. If you love the man, the least you owe him, the least you owe him is the courtesy of letting him rest in peace. Today, Sandy Serrano insists that she never recanted and that her evidence was true, but she is now too scared to speak out publicly. Well, certainly, she's in fear of her life. Uh, probably, if I had good sense, I'd be in fear of my life. But why should the Los Angeles police devote so much time and effort to conceal the truth? And who would benefit from the assassination of Bobby Kennedy? There are those like Paul Chiraga who believe the CIA was deeply implicated. There were incidents uh, that I've found out since that uh, indicate that CIA men were actually running the downtown headquarters, namely the uh, Hernandez and, uh, and Pena, who had retired some years before and went to work for uh, government agencies that were no more than front agencies for the CIA. And lo and behold, on the night of the assassination, they, uh, within minutes, they were present and managing these, this uh, command center, command control center. Sergeant Hank Hernandez and Lieutenant Manny Pena were the two key officers in the polka dot dress inquiry. Hernandez boasted to Sandy Serrano about his polygraph work for government agencies. I have been called to South America, to Vietnam, in Europe, and I have administered tests. The last test that I administered was to, was to the dictator in Caracas, Venezuela. He was a big man, a dictator. Mm -hmm. Pettis Jimenez was the last name. Mm -hmm. And this is when there was a transition in the government of Venezuela, and that's when President Betancourt came in, but this is all behind. But there was a great thing involved over there, mm -hmm. and I tested this gentleman. Hernandez denies ever having worked for the CIA. Paul Chiraga and other critics believe only federal security agencies carried out polygraph tests in such diverse and high-powered circles. Manny Pena was brought in to run the Robert Kennedy investigation from a Washington, D.C. organization, the Agency for International Development. Four years later, a congressional committee would reveal that AID functioned as a front for the CIA. But why should anyone, let alone the anonymous CIA hierarchy, want Bobby Kennedy dead? What motive could it have had? From his days as Attorney General in the John Kennedy administration, Bobby had pursued policies and targeted opponents which directly threatened the CIA. Uh, Mr. His self-proclaimed crusade against organized crime had begun to highlight the long-standing links between organized crime bosses and CIA chiefs, a link exemplified by the joint Mafia-CIA assassination attempts on Fidel Castro. After the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs, he and John had publicly sworn to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces and cast it to the wind. After his brother's assassination, Bobby's support for the student-based anti-Vietnam War movement categorized him in the minds of many Cold War warriors as a threat to national security. One thing is clear in this year of 1968, and that is that the American people want no more Vietnam. A lot of the people in the center and to the right in America did not appreciate that because he was raising problems they wanted to ignore. I think that we have a structure in this country and I refer to them as a corporate war machine, or, or you can refer to them as whatever you want. Uh, I believe that they did and will do anything that they need to, or that they want to, to preserve their status quo. That Cold War mentality flourished above all within the CIA, 
and led to seemingly bizarre experimentation. From the end of World War II to the end of the 1960s, the CIA spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on brainwashing and mind control experiments. Their aim was to create a hypno-programmed robot assassin who would have no memory of his crimes. It was spelled out in this 1953 internal report on Project Artichoke. Can an individual be made to perform an act of attempted assassination under the influence of artichoke? As a trigger mechanism for a bigger project, it was proposed that an individual be induced under artichoke to perform an act, involuntarily, of attempted assassination against a prominent politician or, if necessary, against an American official. And that's about 20% of the population can be regarded as highly hypnotizable. Uh, they can usually be programmed to do something that's somewhat against their grain. Dr. Herbert Spiegel is one of America's leading experts on hypnoprogramming. He has studied the CIA's attempts to create a robot assassin. If we get a highly hypnotizable person who is subject to the proper programming under uh, uh, controlled conditions and is subject to some degree of supervision and exposed to the target uh, within a reasonable range, it is quite possible and even probable that he will comply with the program and end up not being uh, fully aware of what he's doing. By the mid-1950s, internal reports indicate the CIA had accomplished its self-appointed task. Morse Allen, head of the Behavioral Control Program at Langley, Virginia, successfully hypno-programmed his secretary to shoot her best friend with an unloaded gun. Afterwards, she remembered nothing. In general, there is a spontaneous amnesia for the stimulus and the program. Uh, and uh, sometimes if that's reinforced by the instructions of the programmer that you will not remember, the odds of the amnesia is even greater. At his trial, psychologists testified that Siran Siran was in a hypnotic trance throughout the assassination and suffered from a complete memory loss of the shooting. I said to myself, Sirhan, you're going to die for this crime. God damn it, face up to it, at least admit it, make it worthwhile to your own self. And I tried and tried and tried, you know, to recollect it, to, vi you know, to reenact it, but God damn it, nothing, nothing comes up. Because the evidence of hypno-programming was not pursued, Siran's prison psychologist, Dr. Edward Simpson, described the trial as the psychiatric blunder of the century. He pleaded to be allowed to deprogram Siran. But he told me that he was instructed by the warden that he was not to pursue this and not to examine Sir Han any further. And then he said that he insisted that he had the right to do this because he was the official psychologist for the prison. And uh, shortly thereafter, he was um, dismissed. If the CIA's hypno-programmed robot assassin experiment sound the stuff of fiction, its own documents proved that it was possible and that the agency had managed to create hypno-programmed killers by the time Saran fired at Bobby Kennedy. According to experts like Dr. Herbert Spiegel, this fantastic sounding plot has been put into operation. It in fact has happened, but the people who arranged this, this don't go around advertising uh, that they do it or how they do it. But there are always those who need to boast about their experience. William Brown Jr. was for almost a decade retained by the U.S. government as its leading hypno-programmer. Uh, in criminal law, yes I am, I sure as hell am. You have to have the person locked up physically, to have control over them, you have to use a certain amount of physical torture involved, and there is also the use of um, uh, long-term uh, hypnotic suggestion, probably drugs, whatever, and so on. Under these situations, where you have all this going for you, like the prison camp and so on, yes, you can brainwash a person to do just about anything. What I'm speaking about are the innumerable instances that we ran into when I was running the country's brainwashing and anti-brainwashing programs. Less than a year before his death in 1976, William Bryan Jr. allegedly confessed to two prostitutes that he was the man who hypno-programmed Siran Bishara Siran.
It is more than two decades since Robert Francis Kennedy was assassinated. There are still many discrepancies in the official version. This murder is still shrouded in mystery. We asked Los Angeles police to comment on the evidence brought out in this film. This was their response. After a thorough investigation by the detectives of the LAPD Homicide Division, the evidence was passed on to the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, who reviewed all material thoroughly. After said review, the subsequent court case resulted in Suran Suran being found guilty. The only true resolution of this case is to reopen it entirely. We want truth. We want them to investigate cases in whatever manner is necessary to ascertain the truth, and they simply have not done so. They've destroyed evidence. They've altered evidence. They've forced witnesses into retracting statement. And then they've done everything they could to keep all of this from coming out to the public. Recently, a new bid, the second inside a year, was made to persuade the Los Angeles Grand Jury to reopen the investigation. For more than 20 years, the evidence has been suppressed and kept out of court. Don't you think it's about time we were told the truth?